Good morning and welcome to worship with Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church. I am Pastor Katie Day and I am delighted to be worshiping with you today. You might notice things look a little bit different around me. I am not in the sanctuary of Pleasant Hill this week. I was able to travel to Jacksonville, Florida to visit my family and let uh, Elijah get um, some good grandparent and aunt action uh, and attention and love this week. And so I am very grateful to the congregation of Mandarin Presbyterian Church, the church where I grew up, was confirmed, was ordained, was married, and the church from which my mom recently retired for allowing me to film this morning, which is why things look a little bit different. Uh, but I am delighted to be with you today in spirit. I am also joined in worship by Pastor Jenny Sankey, organist Hinju Song. We are blessed by digital recordings from our chancel choir led by Steve Dean. And this whole digital worship service is, as always, expertly produced and edited by Claire Kaiser. Following worship today, we return to Dining and Digging Deeper on Zoom at 1230. Find the link in your weekly email newsletter and join us to reflect on this worship service on the scripture passage and the sermon in a casual group setting. Uh, you can find that link in your newsletter. And if you don't get that newsletter and would like to, you can email office at pleasanthillpc.org and Marianne will get you signed up. Youth group kicks off virtually tonight at 5.30 for all 6th through 12th graders. Check your email for the link, and I know Pastor Jenny is excited to see you all tonight and has some fun things planned. Take some time, if you haven't already, to sign our virtual friendship pad. Let us know you are worshiping with us this morning by filling out the form on our website, pleasanthillpc.org, where you found this week's service. As always, we hope that you are finding time to connect with your church family throughout the week. On our Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church Facebook page, you can check out Happy Hours uh, Tuesdays at 5 and Psalm and Prayer Saturdays at 10 a.m. Uh, Jenny will lead Happy Hour this week and I will lead Psalm and Prayer. And now, let us transition from getting here to being fully present in this time of worship together but apart as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. As we are gathered together, please join me in our call to worship. Through heaven's eyes, we are God's people, and God calls us to freedom. Like Shipra and Pua, Miriam and Pharaoh's daughter, we make way for new life. Like Moses in front of the burning bush, we stand in awe on holy ground. Like the Israelites on the night before their exodus, we remember where we came from. Like Miriam on the far side of the Red Sea, we sing and dance, celebrating God's promises. Through heaven's eyes, we are God's people, called to worship our liberating God. Let us worship God.
God of rainbow and fiery pillar leads us through the waters, promising new life. Let us confess our sins before the God who guides us. Let us pray. O God, who is our strength, you have protected us from those who would seek to oppress us. You have shielded us from those who would seek to destroy the good gifts you have put in us. Your love and power never fail. You have loved us. We have not loved ourselves, nor have we loved one another. You have forgiven us. We have not forgiven others. Take pity on us and forgive us, God. Help us to see ourselves through your eyes. Help us to love through Christ our Lord. Amen. God's hand of mercy is stretched out to us, making a way through all that threatens us to touch us with grace and love. We are God's people, and our journey is led by God's grace. Let us celebrate. Our sins are forgiven, and we are loved. It's on this journey that we are not alone. So in this spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation, let us turn toward the world and our neighbor, saying, the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Good morning, friends. It's time for the children's sermon. So come meet me here on the sanctuary steps or just in your living room so you can see and listen. You might remember the last few weeks, we've been going over the stories about Moses in the book of Exodus. And every week we've had a new item to help us remember that story. Do you remember what this first one was? Moses' mother put him in a basket and put him in the Nile River to save his life from the Egyptians. But a princess found him and saved him and raised Moses. Another story we read about Moses was the story of the burning bush. Moses had left Egypt, he was an adult now, got a new job as a shepherd, and was out one day when God spoke to him from a bush that was on fire but wasn't being burned up. And God said, Moses, you are going to lead the Israelites, my people, out of Egypt, out of slavery. So Moses went to do that. The night before they left Egypt, though, God told them to have a very special meal, which was our story last week, the meal of Passover. They ate a special kind of bread that doesn't rise up big and fluffy, unleavened bread, and they we still eat and celebrate and remember this meal that marked the night before they left slavery in Egypt. Now today's item I brought is some blue fabric. It's like water, is what I want you to think of when you see this. This story today is about water. It's the beginning of their journey out of Egypt. Moses had asked Pharaoh over and over again to let my people go, and Pharaoh said no, and over and over again. But finally, Pharaoh gave in and said, fine, get out, go. So Moses led the people all the way to the edge of the Red Sea, only to find out that Pharaoh had changed his mind, and Pharaoh had brought his army and was chasing them down. They were scared. But then... Watch and see what God is going to do. In this clip of the movie about Moses' life, The Prince of Egypt.
with this staff, you shall do my wonders. Moses stretched his hands out and God divided the waters and the Israelites walked through on dry land. What happens next? If you kept watching, a little bit scary. The Egyptians try to chase them across, but God makes the waves crash down upon them and they don't make it. But the Israelites make it through to the other side. They are free. Their journey has begun God led them across the water, through the water, between the water, and God will lead them toward the promised land. God will be with them every step of the way. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for leading your people through the waters. Help us to trust and follow you to new life. Amen. All right, we'll see you next week. Bye. Good morning. I'm Kate Garrett, and along with Colin Ching and teaching Confirmation this year. Confirmation is an opportunity for our youth to ask big questions by exploring their faith and doubt alongside one another, their teachers, and covenant partners. And we are excited to be a part of this experience. The Book of Order of the Presbyterian Church USA, the book that governs us as Presbyterians right after the Bible, talks about recognitions of special occasions and transitions in life. And the confirmation process is certainly one of those transitions. Today, we recognize a group of eighth graders as they begin a year of confirmation class. Our confirmants this year are Ben Badinger, Kayla Dixon, Colin Garrett, Mark Rogers, and Maggie Woolley. We want to recognize that you are engaging in the act of intentionally exploring your faith in an entirely new way. Some of you were baptized as infants and your parents and church community made promises on your behalf. This is a chance for you to think about those promises and decide if you are ready to affirm those promises or confirm them for yourself. This time is for you to explore what it means for you to claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God has always called us to covenant together to be God's people to create a community that seeks the Lord and knows of our story and that shares the good news of God's steadfast love. 
As we begin this journey, we'll ask our confirmands to commit to the process of exploring their faith, the covenant partners to commit to their relationship with the confirmands, and the congregation to support them in this endeavor. So our first question is for our eighth graders. So go ahead and unmute yourselves. Will you, in the presence of this congregation, promise to commit yourself to this journey through prayer, study, and exploration with your energy and God-given gifts? Will you? I will. I will. I will. I will. All right. The next question is for our covenant partners. Representing the body of the congregation and church, each confirmant's been paired with a covenant partner who will be interacting with their partner through this process. Matt Hoffman, Michelle Wilson, Patrick O'Farrell, Florence Milway, and Bernie Keita will serve in these roles this year. So will you, our covenant partners, promise to pray for your partner, listen to them, ask questions of them, admit when you don't know the answer, and remain open to what God might teach both of you about yourself and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you? I will. And then this question is for our whole congregation. So we hope that wherever you are worshiping today, you'll answer this question aloud. Do you promise to support these young people through your prayers, encouragement, and interest as they seek to learn more about themselves in their relationship with Jesus Christ, will you? I will. Yeah. All right, so normally we would invite all the covenant partners to come up to the front of the church with their confirmands and we would lay hands on them and pray. We can't do that physically on their shoulders right now, but we can still pray for our eighth graders. So as a church, Let's pray for them together, wherever you're worshiping from today, and we will symbolically lay hands on them as we pray. So let's pray. Loving God, we are grateful that you've claimed us as your own. We pray this morning for these young people as they begin this journey. Nurture them and guide them so that they may come to know you more fully. Give us the wisdom to support them during this important time. Ground them in your truth and guide them by your spirit that together with all your people, they may grow in faith, hope, and love and be your faithful disciples. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right.
Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. Listen for God's word to us this morning. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. Our story this morning continues our series on the book of Exodus and picks up a couple chapters after last week. Following the series of plagues unleashed on Egypt in order to get Pharaoh, the current cruel and oppressive king and a line of cruel and oppressive kings to release the Hebrew people from slavery, to let them go so they could be free to worship their God, the one true God, our God, and live into the promises made in the covenant with Abraham following this series of nine plagues, the 10th, the death of all firstborn Egyptians, was enough to get Pharaoh to release the people. He called Moses and Moses' brother Aaron to him in the middle of the night saying, go and worship your God. And the people were ready and they went. 600,000 men plus women and children joined, journeyed on foot from Egypt to Succoth with livestock and herds of animals. And chapter 13 tells us that God led the people in a roundabout way as to avoid war with the Philistines and led them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, at this point, while the Israelites are roundabout journeying, Pharaoh decides to go back on his word and he sent his army to reclaim the formerly enslaved Israelites. And when the people saw the full military force of Egypt deployed after them, they panicked and they accused Moses of bringing them into the wilderness to let them die. And they said it would be better to remain enslaved in Egypt. Now this is heartbreaking. For those of us who have read the book and we know how it ends, this is heartbreaking to witness this community of God's chosen and beloved people long for enslavement 
long for a limited, oppressed existence, not to get too metaphorical, but how often does that happen? How often are we on the brink of liberation only to look backward and not forward? And out of fear, long to return to what we know. Fear would keep us bound, but God would set us free. God saw what was happening and God instructed Moses to lift up his staff and to stretch his hand over the sea and the people could walk through on dry ground. But before that happened, the presence of God who had gone before the people from the moment of, of leaving Egypt, leading them in a pillar of cloud and fire, the presence of God moved to the back of the crowd instead serving as a buffer between the people of Israel and the Egyptian army. Now this kept the Egyptians from being able to see and attack, but it also kept the Hebrew people from being able to see what they feared. The presence of God had guided them and now would protect and reassure them by physically directing their gaze no longer to the past, but to the future toward a new beginning together as wide and open as the sea. And Moses stretched out his hand and the waters parted and the people walked across the sea on dry land. It's a fantastic story, except the Egyptians. The Egyptian army pursuing the Israelites, they were slaughtered in the waters as the sea returned to its normal level. Almost immediately following the plague of the death of the firstborns, it's, it's too much. The text tells us that God was expecting this to play out the way that it did, had even said a few verses before our passage that I read this morning, I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. The story says that God confused them, caused them to panic, and caused the wheels of their chariots to stick, and they tried to turn back. Why not end the story there? But no, they were tossed into the sea. God, our God, tossed them into the sea. And the text reads that Israel saw the dead bodies of the Egyptians on the shore. This is a story of liberation, a story of triumph, of victory over oppression and cruelty. And yes, the Egyptians under Pharaoh's rule had done terrible things in the domination and enslavement and abuse of a people, God's people. But this last bit about them being tossed into the sea and then the dead bodies on the shore. It's, it's just terrible. And it shows the lengths to which God will go to defend, protect, and liberate the people, to uphold the covenant. And it makes me uncomfortable because what if I'm an Egyptian? How often have I stood in opposition to God's plan and purpose, participating in unjust systems simply because it was easier than removing myself or taking a stand? And how often have I denied justice or denied dignity to someone turned my back on the poor or someone in need? More times than I can probably ever know, let alone care to admit, or acknowledge or relive in my memory because I think that most days I am closer to the flesh pots of Egypt than the unleavened bread eaten on the wilderness journey of the Israelites. I am privileged, powerful, and live a very comfortable existence. And there is nothing inherently wrong with that until I don't turn aside sometimes to wonder who doesn't have that privilege and power and comfort until all of that reframes my worldview and reorients my norms to worshiping and protecting my relatively charmed life. 
And in the midst of this pandemic, when my social world has shrunk down to my immediate family and I've grown used to the ease of ordering anything I can dream of online to be delivered by jet and truck right to my door, and I have literally all of the knowledge of the world at my fingertips in this device, how can this seemingly gifted, blessed, safety and sanctuary be bad? I mean, I'm doing my part, right? I'm staying in, I'm staying safe. I'm supporting independent fabric artists by purchasing handmade masks. I'm tipping my grocery delivery shoppers really well. It is easy for me to turn off the news, to put down the phone, to ignore the cries of those who suffer. But it's not like I'm actively pursuing someone in a chariot, right? And I always have a good excuse. And that's how I know. I'm an Egyptian. Do I deserve to be tossed into the sea? Surely not. But that's how the story goes. And that's how God's stories go. The things that stand in opposition to God's plan, all that actively opposes justice, compassion, mercy, equity, will eventually be destroyed. And that is good news. I promise it is good news. Pastor Lane Alderman, beloved former pastor of our neighboring congregation, Roswell Presbyterian Church, wrote this before his death about this passage. It is not just about the defeat of the Egyptians. It begins and ends with the victory of God's people. By the power of God, new life has begun for the people of God. Come join, walk away from the armies of this world that cling to the power and pleasure and the goods of this world. We are children of the covenant now. Those of us gathered this morning, worshiping together across time and space, we are children of the covenant now, grafted onto God's family tree, along with so many other misfits and outcasts and sinners. The ultimate victory of God's people is our victory. And God is always and ever about liberation even when we cannot or will not see the chains that bind us. When we try to look at our lives through heaven's eyes, we can see the whole picture, the bad and the good, and the hope for our redemption. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Jenny told us that we don't get a burning bush, right? God doesn't call to everyone in the way that Moses was called. Well, you don't get a parting of the Red Sea either. God doesn't liberate us all in such a dramatic fashion, but we are set free, free from sin, free from selfishness, free from the status quo, and we are set free for God's grand purpose, to participate in justice and compassion, mercy and equity so that we might join in the good news of liberation even as we witness the pain and the loss of this world, as the Israelites did upon reaching the other side of the sea. God's ways are not our ways. The Hebrew people are set free, according to the stories, only to wander in the wilderness for years and years before coming to the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. We'll hear some of those wandering stories next Sunday. The people were free, given new life, but a homeless and meandering life on the road. God's ways are not our ways. When God called Moses to this work of liberation from the burning bush, Moses had to turn aside to see it, to hear it. But here in this part of the story, God saw the people's need for liberation as so dire that they had to be actively turned toward it, shielded and walled off from the past in order to move forward. And we are much the same today, I believe. 
We know our past by heart and we keep practicing it, rehearsing it, narrating and storytelling in all the ways from the holidays we celebrate to the resentments we hold dear. And God, even now, is physically reorienting us to our liberation, even as it doesn't appear as obviously in front of us as God sees it. May we experience liberation in getting to see ourselves in some revealing moments in all our Egyptianness, And may we feel not shame, but relief. And may God's constant presence protect and reassure us as we are guided into an unknown future. And may we ever practice that sacred curiosity that was Moses' call and is ours as well for what else or who else we are being called to be. Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning comes to us from a brief statement of faith, which was created by the newly united Presbyterian Church USA upon the occasion of reunification of two branches of Presbyterian Church tradition in 1983. Let us confess what we believe using these words. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. It's time to go to God in prayer. First, we'll begin silently as we name the concerns and joys on our hearts before God. Then I'll guide us with words in our pastoral prayer, and we will close together saying the Lord's Prayer aloud. So let us pray. God of fire and cloud, you led your people out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, toward the Promised Land. Your unfailing love has been the source of our strength. It has led us through troubled waters and away from our enemies. In your infinite love, you have had pity on us and heard our cries. Because of that faithful love and mercy, we bring our prayers to you, the one who leads us forward. Lead your church to learn to follow as we look for signs of your presence, offer compassion in the way Christ showed us, and live out your good news. Lead us to be instruments of your love, forgiveness, and grace. Lead our global community to learn to live for each other. As people seek shelter from fire, as the survivor search breaks hearts in Beirut and scientists work toward a COVID vaccine worldwide, lead us in peace and cooperation to share collective responsibility. Lead our homeland to learn to listen to each other as candidates run for election, voters discern their conscience, and Americans struggle to communicate with one another. Lead us in empathy and wisdom to remember one another's status as child of God. Lead those who suffer in mind, body, or soul to comfort as new and old illnesses live among us, as loneliness and isolation weighs heavily and anxiety surrounds many. Lead us to be what our neighbor needs as we are wrapped in your loving arms. 
Just as Miriam danced upon crossing the Red Sea, let us dance in celebration and trust of your gift of new life. Lead us on by day and by night to proclaim the good things you have done. And hear us as we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, now is the time in the service where you are invited to contribute financially to the mission and ministry of this church community, Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, writes the psalmist. And so we are, we are privileged for the opportunity to return to God some of what we have been given and the ways that we have been blessed. So I hope that you will give joyfully and generously, not because I am inviting you to, but because you want to respond to God's grace in gratitude and to participate in the work that this congregation has been called to. You can give in a variety of ways. You can return to our website, pleasanthillpc.org, and click the Giving tab. You can text Give PHPC to the number on the screen, or you can mail your offering to the church office directly, 3700 Pleasant Hill Road, Duluth, Georgia, 30096. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks for the generosity of the givers and the gifts that we receive that enable us to continue doing the things that we want to do, the things that we believe you are calling us to do. Accept and use these gifts for the service of your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And as always, oh God, transform our lives so that everything we say and do may become an offering to you. In Jesus' name, amen. trust in God's 
covenant, God's promise, God's love for us. May we participate in God's liberation as God protects us and assures us and turns us from our past into a future, even a future that is unknown. May we trust God and trust the journey. And know this, know that as we go, as we journey along, we do not go alone, but we go together as a community, as a family of faith. And the love of God surrounds us and the peace of Christ attends us and the friendship of the Holy Spirit keeps us today and every day. Amen. Thank you.